Section 15.4, Conditional Probability and Independent Events. I'm going to start off with the definition of conditional probability. If E and F are events, then the conditional probability, the probability of E given F, is the probability that E occurs given that F occurs. Okay, so I'm going to fill in the word given here, but it's also worth mentioning that's how I translated that vertical line right there as the word given. And it is a vertical line, it's not a slash like a fraction. All right, so to try and understand what they're talking about there, let's look at an example. Consider rolling a balanced six-sided die, standard die, and determine each of the following. Find the probability that a five is rolled, given that the result is odd. So notice that I read that as given. So here's how I like to do these. They say we're gonna roll a die. So I start thinking about, well, what's my sample space? It's the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But then the next thing I do is I think about the given and how does that change things. If they tell me the result is odd, what does that mean? It means that it's not a 2, and it's not a 4, and it's not a 6. So that given has the effect of shrinking my sample size down by eliminating the numbers 2, 4, and 6. So Whereas normally when somebody talks about probabilities with rolling a standard die, I think the denominator is going to be 6. In this case, it's going to be 3 because I only think about the things that fit into the given, the odd numbers, 1, 2, 3 of them. And then what's the probability that a 5 is rolled? Well, out of these three things, how many are 5s? Just this 1. So it's 1 out of 3, or approximately 0 0.3333. 3, 3, 3. All right, let's try another one. What's the probability that the die is a 5 given that an even number is rolled? So same idea. We're rolling a die, so start off thinking about the original sample space, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then go to the given. It's an even number, so we can cross off these odds. We know those are not the ones that happen. So our denominator is just the set of even numbers, what's remaining in our sample space after we consider the given. And then Here's the key. Out of these three, how many are fives? You might be tempted to say there's one five on a die, but we're talking about out of these three numbers, and the three we're talking about are the two and the four and the six. There's no fives left in that list. So the probability of rolling a five, given that someone has told you the result was even, is zero out of three, or just zero. All right, let's look at a couple more. The probability the die is even, given that it's a four or less. So I like this idea of always making it visual when it's reasonable to do so. So start off listing all the numbers on the die, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then we're given that it's a 4 or less. So if it's a 4 or less, then it's not a 5 and it's not a 6. So we can cross those two things out of our sample space. And there's four things left over. So that would be my denominator for this question. And then out of these four things, how many are even? Might be tempted to say three, right? Because there's normally three even numbers on the die, but we're saying out of these four, how many are even? So we've just got those two, the two and the four. So it's important to do the denominator first, because if you did the even part first, you'd probably do one, two, three, and count to six. But when you do the given first, you realize the five and six have been eliminated. That's why there's only four things. And if you think about the even out of these four, there's only two. And two out of four would become one half. All right, another question that's kind of interesting to ask with probability things is, does it matter what order they're asked in? So if they ask the probability of four or less given that it's even, which is the same as the last question, but just switched around, does it make a difference or is it the same? It turns out with stuff we did in the previous section, like and and or, it doesn't matter if it's the probability of A or B versus the probability of B or A, it's the same answer. Probability of A and B versus the probability B and A, it's the same answer. So how about with a given, does it matter? Well, let's think it through. So first of all, let's list our original sample space. One, two, three, four, five, six from the standard die. And then we're being told that it's an even number. So we can cross off all of the odds. We know it's not any of those. So that means our denominator is what's left over, which is just three things. And we're not going to get a half if we put a whole number over 3. So it looks like these are different. It looks like the order really does matter on conditional probability. All right, so of those three things that are left over, how many are 4 or less? This one, 
and that one are four or less. So just two out of the three, which if you go to a decimal is 0 0.6667. So two things to note, the order does matter. And the other thing that goes with that then is that means that you have to really pay attention to which one is the given. So um, it's always the second piece that is the given that you use to reduce your sample space. Then after you do that, you move to the front half and say how many of these things meet that description. So to me, the key to making conditional probability not too complicated is to think about what was your original sample space and then shrink it down to the given. So when you compute a conditional probability, the given becomes the new sample space. So if you can think of it that way, conditional probability can be fairly simple and it doesn't need complicated rules. All right, so we don't need rules, but there is a conditional probability rule, and I want to show you kind of a version of it. This isn't the official conditional probability rule, but I want you to think about what's happening on our answers up here. So first of all, the denominator is always the count of whatever was in the given. So in this case, that would be the count of B. But what's going on in the top? So I want to go ahead and show you something uh, that you might not have noticed. Let's go ahead and list out our sample space with the die one more time. So we have one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then what I want to do a little bit different here is I want to circle some stuff. Let's just use this right here, the four or less and the even. So let's do the four or less. I'll circle those in teal. And then let's take the red pen and do all the even numbers. So the two, the four, and the six. What I want you to notice, if you look at these two questions up here, regardless of the order even or four or less, whichever one came first, the part we ended up counting these two numbers was the two and the four both times. And if you look at this picture, the two and the four is the overlap of what was circled in teal and what I boxed in red. The two was in the teal and the red, the four was in the teal and the red. So it turns out that your numerator is always a count of the overlap of the two events. All right, so that ends up playing into something called the conditional probability rule. But again, I think it's best not to use rules, but just use this note. When you're trying to compute a conditional probability, the given becomes the new sample space, and then you answer the first part in the leftovers. All right, another topic, statistical independence. Two events, E and F, are independent if the probability of E given F is the same thing as the probability of E without the given of F. In words, two events are independent if one occurring does not affect the probability of the other event occurring. So if events are not independent, then we say they are dependent. So that does show up in the probability that they don't affect each other because we're saying somebody asks, what's the probability of E? And we would give an answer to that. And then they go, oh, wait, I forgot to tell you. I, I actually wanted the probability of E given F. And we're saying, oh, it's the same answer either way. So it has the implication that the given isn't making a difference in the probability. And if that's the case, we say those events are independent from each other. So we'll see a good example of that on the next page. All right, so let's go ahead and look at another example involving a two-way table. That'll allow us to practice conditional probability and to investigate this new concept of independence a little better. So this is the same table we looked at in a previous section, but let's read through it real quick. The 2011 survey asked 1,120 Americans if they believed that the laws covering the sale of firearms should be made more strict, less strict, or kept as they are now. The responses are summarized below together with the region of the country that the respondent is from, data based on a Gallup poll. If a person from this group is randomly selected, determine the probability that the person is person favors more strict gun laws. All right, so the person favors more strict gun laws is just a standard probability, the probability of more strict, which is A1. And when you're asked to Traditional probability question about a two-way table, you use as your denominator the grand total, and then you say how many things in the whole table are A1, and that's 507. So that's just kind of a review of a basic probability from a two-way table, and we don't like to leave those messy fractions for our probabilities, so I'll convert that to a decimal, 0.45.
two, seven. All right, so now let's start using this table to practice the givens. Find the probability that the person favors more strict gun laws given that they are from the South. So the more strict gun laws is A1. The given, we would translate as a straight up and down vertical line. And it's given that they're from the South, and the South is region R3. So we want the probability of A1 given R3. All right, so on the previous page, we said that when you're doing a problem involving a given, the given becomes your new sample space. So I'm gonna use teal for this one and say R3, because it's the given, is my sample space for this problem. So I'm gonna circle R3, and I'm gonna say that as we answer this question about the probability of A1, we have to only use numbers from the given, R3. It's like we've crossed off every other part of the table. So then, when you think about, for the denominator, how many things are possible, if you're only looking at this row, then instead of 1120 possibilities, there's only 208, the total of the row, which represents the given. And then, of those 208, how many are A1? So for A1 from the whole chart, there's 507. But we're just thinking about in R3. So how many of these circled in teal are A1? That would just be these 79. So when you're doing a given on a contingency table, the given becomes your new sample space. So you should circle that row or column, whichever it is, and then only use numbers from there to answer this question. And then we like decimals instead of fractions, so 79 over 208 is approximately 0.3798. All right, so now let's look at a question that involves independent and dependent. Are the events that the person favors more strict gun laws and the event that the person is from the South independent or dependent events? So how do we do that? Well, we've got the probability of A1 by itself, and we've got the probability of A1 given R3. So according to the previous page and the definition that we had there, if you want to check if things are independent, see if you get the same answer with the given as you get without the given. Well, with the given, the answer is 0.3798. Without it, it was 0.4527. Since these are not equal, these two events are not independent. They are dependent. So I would say because the probability of A1 given R3 was not the same as the probability of A1, that implies that these are not independent, so therefore they are dependent events. And by the way, if you're just looking at the fractions, it can be kind of hard to tell if those fractions are equal or not, so the decimal is really helpful in sorting out whether we've got the same probability or not. All right, let's try this independence thing one more time. Are A2 and R4 independent events and explain? Well, I can't just jump in and give an answer like this because I don't know the probabilities. So the first thing I need to do is investigate probabilities. Pick one of these. Let's just do the first one. And let's find the probability of A2 all by itself. And then what we want to do is find the probability of that same one again, but with the given of the other event. And you could do this differently if you want. You could put an R4 here. But if you put R4 here, then this needs to be an R4 given A2. Either way, we'll produce the same eventual results, even though the middle steps will look different. So I just like to do it in order. All right, so let's look at those probabilities. A2 by itself, no given. So we use the grand total of the table, 1120. And we go look at this whole table and say in the whole table, how many things are A2? 462 out of 1120. All right. But how about if it's A2 given R4? So let's mark this one with red. So the given is R4. So I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna circle R4 and say, all right, that's my given for this problem. So I can only use numbers that come from that row. So instead of the total being 1120, if I have to stick in row four, the total will be 320. And then, out of those 320 things that are in R4, how many are A2? Not in the whole table, but just in this row. So how many are A2 in the red row? And it looks like in the red row, here's A2, there's 132 things that work. 
Now again, when you look at those as fractions, it's kind of hard to tell. Are they equal or are they not equal? And we need to know the answer of that to decide if they're independent or dependent. So what I'm going to do is bring in the calculator. 462 over 1120 is 0.4125. And 132 divided by 320 is 0.4125. So you couldn't tell that maybe a moment ago with these unreduced fractions. But it turns out that you get the same answer to that question whether R4 is a given or not. And so then we could say, because the probability of A2 given R4 was equal to the probability of A2, that implies that we had independent events this time. And then just thinking about what that means in terms of the application, so A2 was the question of what's the probability somebody favors less gun control. And what we're saying here is it doesn't matter if you ask that question about the whole country or if you just ask it about the West. In this group of people, you get the same answer. So among this group of 1,120 people, whether they favor less gun control is independent of whether or not they live in the West, which is kind of interesting. Um, for the other question, it mattered where they lived. For this one, it turns out it didn't. All right, that wraps up this section.